Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jonathan Richards from Breathe. And here's Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi, Jonathan. Nice to see you. So um, let, let's get things going. So today's um, today's topic is around the, the subject of resilience um, and particularly resilience around um, adapting to the abnormal. So I guess we've all been been working from home now where we can or working in, in sort of strange ways for what is it four or five weeks um, and I think you know, many people have managed to make the the journey into to adapting the way they work but there's, there's sort of something my feeling is there's something happening around about now where people are realizing that you know it's not it's not changing the way we did yesterday it's doing it a new way today is that the sort of thing you're seeing? I'm definitely seeing. Uh, what am I seeing? I'm seeing. Well, I'm seeing a kind of a kind of a weariness creeping in. You know, there was a huge surge of energy uh, and effort uh, and kind of excitement blended with terror. I think. Yeah. Uh, in the early stages, where, where where people were in that transition, and. Uh, and I think and it's interesting. I mean, I, I myself had a really tough week last week. It was like, you know, whatever it was, week five or whatever. And I think, oh, it was like, you know, running a marathon and I was really running out of energy in general. And in simple terms, that's kind of what I'm seeing with the organizations that I've been working with. And perhaps I could summarize it best as a, perhaps the beginning of a recognition that 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 we can't keep pretending that we can carry on yeah do you know what i mean so it's like we transitioned and then we were like we've got to keep all these plates spinning and actually you know what we we just can't and i think the dawning of that realization is people just generally are feeling tired uh it's taking its toll so look i realize we've we've just jumped straight in there and rude of me i didn't give you a chance to introduce yourself so why don't you give us a little bit about who you are and what you do that's a very good point so so i'm a, from an organization called then somehow and um, we work with our clients to uh, help them change the way their people behave, the way the culture operates in their organization. So we do lots of work with leadership teams. We do lots of work with teams. And we're really interested in the practical things you can do to make work better. And, and right now, we're spending quite a lot of time working with teams in how they adjust to remote working. We're uh, putting together webinars and support materials for managers to help them think about Crikey, what, what, what do my people need? How can I be a good manager right now right. Uh, in the remote setting? And we've, you and I have known each other for, I don't know, many, many years. I think the first time we came across each other, you were doing a presentation for us in a, at a seminar down in Brighton. Um, but since then, we've worked together. You work with, with us in the leadership team at Breathe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a lot of, lot of good background there. So when when we were talking, we, we this is the the third or fourth in a series of of webinars that we're running, and when we were planning this one, we were sort of saying, well, people are going through maybe a three or four stage journey. So the first off is the ah, hang on, we've got to work from home. How the heck do we do that? And then they're getting to the stage where I think we sort of are now by, all right. So what is this thing, the new normal that we've been talking about? No, it doesn't feel very normal. It certainly feels new. And then we're going into a stage at some point fairly soon where there's a lot of conversations about how do we go back or, or, or maybe more correctly, what's the new way forward? Mm. Um, and then there's the, the, maybe the fourth stage of actually doing that. Mm. So what we wanted to do was just to explore today and to get some thoughts around um, this idea of transitioning to the new normal. Now, what what does what does transitioning mean? What does new normal mean? But mostly around the idea of resilience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is it? What does it take to be resilient when everything around you seems to have been all the balls are up in the air and, and none seem to be coming into land? Yeah. So maybe maybe we should just sort of kick off on. Um, oh, I should say, please ask us questions along the way. Um, if if you've got questions, then please we're looking at the the chat um, if you could ping them to us and we'll, we'll we'll take up questions of that so you know you, you said something really interesting to me yesterday was that none of this is unique 
that what we're trying to do now, what we need to do now is, is kind of the way we should be running our businesses as is. Do you want to sort of kick off by exploring that idea? Okay, so, you know, it occurs to me, so people say to me, how do I manage remotely? And uh, actually, you just need to manage doing all the things that you should have been doing beforehand that you maybe didn't need to because you didn't have to pay so much attention to the way you're communicating because you can see people, you're getting feedback, you're, you're having several meetings a day with them in some cases, certainly several times a week. Uh, and now that we don't have that physical content contact um we don't we can't see what's going on um and we perhaps haven't practiced the muscles around communication and you know maybe we're beginning to worry and be concerned about what might be going on that we can't see or we worry that the people that we can't see aren't okay or we can see they're not okay via zoom or whatever yeah. but we're not very good at perhaps asking how they're doing because you know crikey we're all you know we're british in this country aren't we yeah we're ever so professional <laughs> don't show our feelings no we never show our feelings we don't talk about that kind of stuff uh, and, and and of course you know despite that no matter how stiff our upper lip may be we are still highly emotional creatures um and, and at a time like this you know the need to be able to recognize that aspect of who we are yeah. is really important actually yeah okay now i get it and the um when I was when I was preparing again, I was just looking at what what does resilience mean, and I think there's an interesting one to start with the dictionary definition. Um, there's there's two ways that that resilience is described. One is it talks about toughness, and the other talks about elasticity. And I thought there was an interesting conflict a bit between those two, in that toughness when when something hits it, if you're tough, you just, it, you don't flex. Whereas elasticity is all about taking the punch and then sort of coming back from it. And which, you know, does that, does that strike something with you? Is it, is resilience all about being just hard and, 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 you know, almost impervious to it? Yeah, no, of course not. Of course not. Because, uh, um, you know, if you, if you exist in denial, you know, you will break. In fact, I, I think um, uh, I was chatting, I think it was you, Jonathan, actually mentioned it when we first began this conversation about you were working with a, a group of your peers, so other CEOs of organizations, right, and having a peer-to-peer -peer session. And you said something really interesting to me. Um, I could see on the Zoom how tired we all looked and nobody mentioned it. And that struck me as a, as a, as a really it's a massively lost opportunity because right? you guys are all being strong. Okay. You know, it's exhausting running an organization and being strong on behalf of everyone else, taking the yeah. burden of, you know, the financial implications of this, the, the logistical difficulties, the contingency planning, the showing a brave face to make sure everybody else feels safe. Right. Which is great and incredibly generous, but it also introduces risk because if you, are not paying attention to your own resilience and to your own well-being, then you're hugely increasing the likelihood that you might break. And if you broke in that structure that you've created for yourself, then everybody will suffer. You know, and the fact that you guys, in confidence among peers, with nobody to show a brave face for, couldn't even talk about that. It's like ah, that's such a shame. Yeah. Because actually, you probably all could have done with a, you know, at least some sympathy or some empathy or discovering you're not alone. Yeah, that's incredibly important. So I think the number one thing around that is, yeah, trying, yeah, trying to be impervious, not bending. That's a mistake. You know, the trees that don't go with the wind fall down. So something in this is about accepting that this is not normal, that this is extremely alarming, that despite being in charge, you do not have all of the answers, right? You don't yeah. know. You have to accept it. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And you have to pay attention to your own well-being in this, you know, and, and we all know the basics, get some sleep, you know, uh, you know, don't drink too much, don't <laughs> breathe, you know, create some space for yourself. So you've got to stop working and have some boundaries. Um, you need some time with your family, with your loved ones. You need to be getting out and doing your daily exercise. You need to, you know, get into nature if you can. Um, because a little bit of that downtime is what you might need to get some perspective and certainly to take the pressure off yourself. 
Yeah. You know, and if you don't have a peer network, then try and find people you can you can trust. Maybe old 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 pals, you know, from back in the day. Because if you can't unburden yourself, then you are putting yourself at risk. You know, you're that tree that's going to crash down, not the one that's going to bend with with the leaves. Yeah. So I, think, I think that's a really important point. Just you know, do not take it for granted that, that, that you have to be strong all the time. And, and I think it's also important that. I, I find that when it comes to, to being resilient, it's not something that you think about as you're doing it. It's something that you kind of realize you were afterwards. Right. You know, I think I, I see it as being a muscle that you can exercise, but it's not something that you have. It's something that you, you get, you almost earn it by, by going through whatever it is that's challenging you. Right. And I think that, that you know, the, the danger here is that we don't recognize that we might need to use different muscles right now. You know, I mean, I mean, we might have been using the right muscles all along, but maybe not. And certainly in my experience, when you go into lots of organizations, they're not the muscles that people are habitually using. Yeah. yeah. One night, <clears throat> talk about muscles. But I guess what I mean is, um, you know, it is being able to, um, to recognize how hard it is and perhaps show some vulnerability. You know, we're often frightened of uh, admitting that we don't feel safe or that we don't know the answers. But yeah. time and time again, when I have seen people um, show a bit of vulnerability, far from undermining themselves, they uh, generate a huge amount of support, um, empathy, uh, kind of encouragement from their peers. I was a, um, I'll give you an example. I did a workshop recently, you know, this was a face to face was back in the day when we were face to face, right? Wow. Um, with a client and uh, day before I got a phone call from one of the participants who I knew pretty well. And she said, just need to let you know, I'm not feeling great. So oh, what's wrong? She goes, well, my mental health's not great at the moment. And you know, we're still not brilliant to talk about mental health. I know. So I was like, Ooh, crikey, you know, but she was completely, completely calm about it. She says, no, I'm suffering a lot from anxiety. I'm really struggling. I had a lot of time off work. I'm coming tomorrow, but I don't know if I can last it. I just don't know what's going to happen. I'm feeling really anxious. All right, of course, it's fine. What do you want me to do? Nothing. I'm just telling you because I might have to leave the room if it feels a bit overwhelming and that's, I don't want any big fuss. Fine. I said, are you happy to talk about that with the others? She said, yeah, yeah. They know about it. So we started the session with a check-in. I just went around and said, look, how's everybody feeling before we begin? It's just useful to know, right? And I think she was the second person to go. And the first person was like, yeah, no, I'm fine. I'm all good. You know, I'm happy to be here. You know, definitely a level one answer. And she went straight into level five. And she said, yeah, my mental health's not great. I don't know how I'm going to be. I might have to leave the room. And um, everybody was just like, oof, wow. That's amazing that you said that. If, you know, you, you're coming across as incredibly strong, not incredibly fragile right now. And uh, there was this kind of overwhelming kind of surge of empathy and compassion for this person. But crucially, it gave permission for everybody else in the room to actually say what was really going on. Yeah. And then the conversation that we ended up having went a lot deeper, a lot quicker about actually the underlying dynamics of what was happening in that team. So it was really interesting that moment of vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And I think it's, it's relevant now. Yeah. Because if we, for example, start a meeting where we might offer a check-in like that, it's like, how's everybody doing? Can I just tell you as the boss that I'm having good days and bad days, you know, and, and I'm all right today, but yesterday I was feeling really wobbly. You know, actually what that does is maybe give permission for other people in your leadership team to say, yeah, actually hands up me too. Yeah. Um, we um <clears throat> we start every every leadership team meeting and a couple of the other regular meetings in the business with with a check-in and we actually use we use a numbering system of one to ten um and we just score ourselves on business and personal mm. and the the flag is that any score of six or below gets talked about right. now, if it's business we talk about it some more but if it's personal somebody has a chance to to say something and I find that's a really good way of giving somebody permission to raise the flag in a, in a relatively easy way. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's a, that's a really important, 
a, re a really important part of every meeting just how you're doing yeah i think it's great because of course if somebody is you know got a, a personal level five situation going on they may not entirely be with you in the room right they might be yeah. distracted yeah um, and um knowing that and understanding it can help you interpret what's going on yeah and, and clearly now more than ever um, yeah. um and not that telling people necessarily changes it but but it can make you feel better yeah so we've had we've had a question come in from from Anne saying, can we talk a bit about organisational resilience as well as personal? And yeah, definitely, Anne. What we've what we've sort of tried to break it down into is there's there's sort of maybe three different kinds of or levels of resilience that are going on. One is one is at the personal level, the second is at the team level, and then the third is at the business level. Uh, and we've we've ordered it in that direction because it all kind of starts, I think, from the the personal level. But very definitely, we'll we'll get into what creates a resilient organisation. Um, so no, absolutely, we're going to do that. So um, when it comes to to conversations in an organisation and to get to get that um, to get those difficult conversations going, to get people feeling like they can be be open and vulnerable. Um, the, the, the concept of the parent adult child relationship, I sort of believe comes in here. Now I can't remember the, the, the body of work that was around it, but what I, what I do remember is the, the real need for parent to parent conversations rather than parent to child. Is that something that you work with? Yeah, I know what you mean, and you mean adult to adult, okay. So- um... I do indeed, yeah. <laughs> All right, so there's two things here, and also thinking about what what about Annie's question. So I think that um, uh, okay, let's just think about how to answer it. So I think in that in that model, the transaction analysis model, right? It it, it it kind of starts off by saying, look, you know, we're kids, we're brought up by our parents, we go to school, we look to our teachers to give us guidance and tell us what to do, and we go on and we do GCSEs and A levels, we even go to university, and actually fundamentally that pattern of being parented by our, our, our teachers uh, is really well established. And often we kind of carry that back in, back into work. And, um, you know, you look at the relationship between managers and their teams and it, it's surprising how common it is to see those kinds of behaviors, right? Because we're human beings and we're kind of hard coded in that way. If someone presents to us as a child, we're programmed to respond as a parent. I need my, my shoelace tying, let me help you tie your shoelace, okay? Um, I, I, uh, I, I don't know how to write this report. You know, the parenting thing will be, maybe I'll help you write that report. Right. Um, the problem with that is that you're keeping that person in the child space, right? Um, uh, it works the other way. So that if you have a, a manager that's uh, kind of micromanaging and parenting, you often kind of go, ah, fine, you know, I'll let you do it for me, right? So you kind of become part of that dynamic and you're both, you're both maintaining it um, much more constructive is where you can meet adult to adult you know so if you're a manager and a member of your team is presenting as child you know and if your instinct is to kind of yeah, do it for them actually it's much probably the nicest of reasons right i know they're really busy they're super stretched they've got a lot going on it's like but actually you're not helping them yeah. develop the skills to write a better report if the report wasn't good enough or maybe you're frightened of giving them feedback that the work wasn't up to scratch but then of course you're denying them the chance to develop okay um and it absolutely works the other way. You know, you can, it's harder when you've got the power dynamic of, of a manager that's presenting as a parent, for example, or worse, a child, bring yeah, them up to yeah. But this strikes me as interesting in this situation where so many of us feel powerless, okay? We are, we are out of our normal conditions. We are working from home. Some of us don't have the right setup at home. Um, you know, we're working on the edges of our beds. On, on, on laptops with poor internet connectivity. Some of us have got family and children that are, that are, that are needing attention and, and support too. Some of us have nobody, right? We're deeply isolated. Yeah. That's incredibly uh, undermining actually. Um, and there's no sense of agency or control in this, right? And then we've got a, a, a layer of management in an organization that's, that's trying to steer everybody through it. And we don't know the answers either. We don't know what's gonna happen. We don't know how things are going to pan out or how safe we're going to be or not. We can't give you any reassurance. Yeah. And it, it strikes me as an interesting 
problem. And maybe one of the ways out of it is to think about, okay, we can't change the situation, but maybe we can involve more of the team in thinking about how we might solve some of the problems. So we started off by acknowledging how people feel, right? But so, you know, you might have concerns about this or concerns about that. Well, maybe the next part of that conversation is, well, what ideas have we got to deal with that or yeah. to make an event? Um, uh, and that might be about how we're organizing ourselves and how we're planning our days and so on and so forth. But it could be that we also start saying, well, okay, well, how do we get ourselves out of this? We're all beginning to wonder now about how we come back. And that's raising concerns about, well, how are we going to organize ourselves in the office? Well, that's not necessarily a problem that the managers need to solve. In fact, allowing the team to discuss that, come up with solutions can be incredibly enabling because we're giving them the agency to engage with those problems. Right? Yeah. Give them some control. So there, I guess we, we kind of sort of start to transition into, we've, we've sort of got the personal now, now we're starting to see getting some, um, some conversations, some communication going as a team. Um, and then you no, know, just what, what are the team dynamics around, around being resilient? Is there such a thing as a resilient team or do resilient people make resilient teams? I think that, um, uh, I, I think that we can be very conscious about, thinking about the behaviors that are going to lead to resilience actually and, and kind of practicing them um, and just thinking I'm slightly distracted because Kay's put a message up here about relationships that were adult to adult may have slipped into parent child I think that's a really good point right yeah so in crisis we often kind of revert back into behaviors that aren't aren't, aren't brilliant right and, and sometimes because because you know what that's the way that I get a sense of control yeah like just do this just do that you know ah right but, you know, we know that those, that those are doing no good for the people that are at the child end of it. They're not doing any good for the organization that's learning unhelpful dependencies. So, yeah, what is, you know, are, are some people more resilient? Well, maybe. Can teams become more resilient? Yeah, they can. Perhaps by thinking about how they take responsibility for the things that they can change, right? Um, how, as managers, we, uh, we, we give permission for that. Or even better, create the conditions, you know, we're all going to be, we're all, we're all in a situation where we're like, huh, our income is uncertain. You know, it's likely to take a hit. How big a hit? I don't know how big a hit. Well, we'll you know, there are things we can immediately do. We can, con we can control, we can ban all discretionary spending. Right? We can, we can cancel all non, all non-essential activity, right? Oh, that's a huge problem for someone like me who, who's often in organizations up in the mind. They're like, no, Steve, we can't. I totally understand. No, you can't. Yeah. Well, commit to that kind of stuff, right? What else can we do to save money? You know, um, uh, or what ideas have we got for generating new income streams? Now, again, those are not answers that we have to come up with on our own. Actually, our teams are hugely well qualified. You know, they understand our businesses, they understand our customers, they are t totally at the coal face. Yeah. So we could be involving them in those kinds of conversations. I think. I was reading. Um... It's sort of interesting language, but the idea of uh, a peacetime leader and a wartime leader, and the idea that a, you know, a peacetime leader is much more, much more collaborative and communicative, and you know a lot of decisions going on further down in the organisation. Whereas a wartime leader, and and the article was written in that we're in wartime now. Um, it needs to be much more decisive, much more punchy, much more, uh, much more committed, committed. But actually, even then, I can see that as being maybe the, the leader has to make the decisions or make the make the drive. But the the input can still come very definitely from the team. It's not a it's not a decision that no. There's an awful lot of organisations out there that we see and talk to that are really struggling, and they can't afford to spend all of that much time talking to everybody and getting everybody's views together. But that upfront honesty of the leader to say to everybody, "Look, you know, we're in trouble. I'm going to treat you like an adult." Probably wouldn't say that, but um, you know, we all need to pull together here if we're going to survive. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really important place to be. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, 
And I think, I was thinking about, um, uh, that aspect of modeling, you know, cause so that's, a, that's, an, that's an example where, you know, it's totally appropriate to show strong leadership, but there are other aspects of modeling where, um, we might need to allow, yeah, you know, if we've got patterns of, 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 um, compliance, say, for right. example, okay. Where, um, where it can be unhelpful. So lots of the organizations that I work with, uh, are kind of deeply compliant culturally there isn't there isn't much no yeah. going on do you know what i mean right yeah, yeah and there's a definite desire to please and provide a good service and um and people are not well practiced at pushing back and i'm i'm observing in some organization situations where the management are going we've really got to focus on the essentials right you know what is the minimum we need to deliver uh and then when you go and talk to people at the cold face they're completely overwhelmed. They are left and right, trying to keep this going, trying to keep that plate spinning and blah, 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 blah. And, and the organization has not been very good at stopping anything. You know, so there might be, there might be lip service paid um, to, uh, you know, to the recognition that we have less resource. You know, yeah. you know, we may have furloughed people. Or even if we haven't furloughed people, the people that we have got are less able to work at the same level because, you know, because they're... Um, uh, distracted by by small people on home learning or because they just not got their heads in the right space you know yeah, yeah. they haven't quite got the technology or you know they're missing bits and there seems to be a gap between you know that stated intent of doing less and the reality is lots of people still trying to do everything right you know or yeah. they'll or, or they'll say you know yes i need to spend time with children on home learning and perhaps i might be spending it with my partner but what they're doing is getting up at six, working till nine, looking after the children perhaps until midday or one, swapping to work an afternoon and then going back on in the evening. So all they're doing is just making the day incredibly long. Yeah. So that's, that's surely down to the organization and more importantly, the leader to be, to be, it's more than just being open to flexibility. It's, and it's more than encouraging flexibility it's expecting the employee to use that flexibility. Right. Isn't right. that? How do we, exactly. And how do we encourage our team members to kind of go, no, I, why, we, why am I doing this? Why, this isn't the most yeah. important thing I could be doing. You know, I'm doing it because I feel like I should be doing it, but actually I can see that it's adding no value. Yeah. You know, I, had a, I had a great meeting yesterday. I, um, I launched my camera and went into a one-to-one -to -one with one of my colleagues and instantly I was expecting her to be sitting there opposite me and I was presented with three faces and she had her two daughters, one sitting on either knee saying, you know, I hope you don't mind, but they just wondered who I was meeting with. What does my boss look like? And, you know, that's just a great thing. And we just had a few minutes chat and the kids were happy and smiling and well, off yeah. they went. I see. I really, I, I really enjoy that. You know, I love yeah. I love the intimacy of it. You know, I know it's a bit weird sometimes seeing the backgrounds of people's houses and things, but like, I love the fact that we're people yeah, <laughs> and we're complicated and messy and interesting. And, and our, and our children are curious, you know, like who is your boss? I love that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 Um, we've had a question in from Sophie. Yes. I saw that too. Read it out. Go on. Um, so could this situation be a real win-win for company culture? Will it help create a, we're all in this together. We made it through. Uh, especially for those of us with young team members. This could be the first time they've experienced uncertainty in business. Yeah, I think that's such a strong point. I, I, this is the exciting part of, you know, the, or the silver lining, isn't it? It's kind of like, um, we've got a really good excuse right now to uh, question the way we've been doing things, the, the way we talk to each other, the way we organize or the way we make decisions, right? We can... You know, this is like this this is the ultimate ace that you can play yeah like we need to talk about this because of the situation but actually this is all stuff that we probably should have been doing anyway you know? yeah this you know what, what's great remote management it's just good management you know um and so let's use this as an excuse actually when it's so difficult to practice things that might help us be stronger yeah you know, so rather than just bouncing back 
and kind of recovering that from that elastic bend, we might actually be stronger afterwards. That's a great opportunity because we can do things that we couldn't, we might have found difficult to do at yeah. the time. So can, if, if, if we find ourselves in a situation now where leading, managing a team or a company is just incredibly hard and we're banging our head against the wall, it's one thing to think, oh, we should have started this process six months or a year ago because then we'd be prepared. What's the way of, I think I probably know the answer to this question, but what's the way of getting started? Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm going to sound, maybe I'm going to sound a bit trite, but you know, it's always the same thing, isn't it? It's all about communication. It's all about having a conversation, right? We, human beings, we make sense of the world through our interactions with it, right? And most of the sense that we choose to create are through our interactions with people, you know, yep. our sense of identity, our sense of, 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 of purpose, you know, all, all organizations exist through those interactions, right? So yeah, you know, yeah, you know, there's no point in crying over spillment. We should have done this six months ago. No, we are where we are. But the best thing you can do right now is start a conversation with our, with our two people about like, how is it the way we're working? Is, yeah. is, is, you know, what, what, and, and, and then nothing like talking about what's going on right now. You know, a, a classic one for me that I've been hearing over the last couple of weeks, probably a bit less so now, is that, you know, people that have, um, oh, this was on the, uh, uh, taking the dog for a walk, bumped into um, one of the mums from school. She was nipping in. I was walking past the school. They're obviously open for key workers and stuff. And she was going to borrow a laptop because she didn't have enough kit at home, for her kids to do the home running stuff. How are you doing? Not great. You know, she said, I can't be furloughed because I work for the NHS. So I got, uh, you know, I couldn't really do with it. I'm trying to do the home learning thing. And I'm trying to be a good colleague. And, you know, I'm trying to answer an email. The children need me and da 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 and, and I was like, why are you trying to do both of those things at the same time? You know, yeah. you, why they need to be doing the home learning, you know, or you're working with your colleagues. And if you can't do both of them fully that's okay maybe you can only do three hours with the children in the morning and i'm not asking you to work, get up early or work really late but maybe the deal with your colleagues is i'm just going to be available in the afternoons and you know i'm sorry to say with the children in front of the tv and playing on computers well if that's what it takes to get sanity that's kind of okay yeah these are the conversations we need to be having and she felt uneasy about saying to her colleagues i can't be available in the morning she felt it was she felt uncomfortable i was like well that's crazy because yeah. you're being a bad colleague and a, and a bad mum and you feel awful all of the time, you need to have that conversation. Yeah. I think also, like just, just touching on Sophie's point again, I feel a little bit uncomfortable sometimes in conversations like this when it maybe becomes a, um, an age or a generation thing. Mm. Now, I think, I think there's an awful lot of really young people who've experienced trauma bad things difficult things and they will be way better prepared than than maybe i would because i've been through a couple of recessions i think sometimes it's actually being where people are and understanding whether where they are facing it um you know the um the experience that i've got from almost losing my business back in the 2008 9 recession um that's no doubt giving me some kind of a leg up here but this situation is totally different to that. Um, so it's, it's very much understanding where people are and what, what people's different capacity is, I think, to, to handle something like this. And that right. capacity changes day to day, moment to moment. Yeah, it really, it really does. And, and, and it's probably got, you know, probably hasn't got anything to do with generations. I mean, yes, it might be a factor. Yeah. That make you a bit older and, and gnarlier and kind of wiser, perhaps. <laughs> you know, yeah. I've met plenty of wise young people. And the thing is, we don't know, we don't know what, what, what wisdom there is to draw on or what ideas there are if we're not creating the conditions yeah. for people to have those conversations, if we're not modeling that stuff. You know, and that yeah. could be about helping themselves individually or helping themselves organize their work, or it could be about getting them involved in the conversation about where we go from this. One thing I do know is, you know, there's nothing worse than being powerless. Right. And that, that sort of comes back to another point that, that you, you touched on a little bit. Um, the idea of giving people control over something. Yeah. Uh, the, um, 
again, it's another thing that we talked about when we were preparing for this was the idea of giving people something definite, definitive ring fence to get their teeth into. So whether you call them objectives, whether you call them tasks or actions or something is to give people a job to focus their minds on yeah. short term. Almost doesn't really matter what it is, but if it can help move the company forward, then all well and good. Uh, I think so. And you don't have to make the assumption that you have to dish that out. You know, that can, that can come out of a conversation about what we collectively agree are the most important things, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's really interesting how and how often we crave certainty. I had a conversation yesterday with somebody who was talking about actually their organization. They've been really great at supporting people and they are already having conversations about, you know, how will we come back? And she yeah. said, they've kind of done like a, a, a criteria for who's going to come back first, you know, so yeah. there are core functions that need to be there, uh, you know, but right near the top of that list are people who are living on their own, who haven't seen their family, don't have any friends, can't see their colleagues. And some of them are really struggling. That is a lonely place to be. Yeah, definitely. You get them in quick. They want them in quick. People who are sat on the edge of beds, they can get in quick. But the people that are going to come back last are the ones that have got a home office, got, got good IT at home, um, who don't need to be there. Actually, they can stay away longer. And she said, that's great. I know I'm going to be here for the next two months minimum. Right. So I, I can stop thinking about it. And it's like, oh, that's so interesting. You know, of course. Yeah. And if you knew you were going to be in your home office for two months, you've got permission to make changes, to do stuff differently, haven't you? You can, you can accept it because yeah. you know it's not going to change. So the moment, one, it's all so uncertain. You know, so arguably, you know, we're all waiting for Boris to tell us when we can go back yeah. and order and that kind of stuff. It's like, actually, you know what? Don't disagree collectively. You know, you know how you know some of some of some some organisations can carry on for a really long time like this. Yeah. Others, the nature of their work means that they can't do anything until they come back. But clearly, they want to come back first. But but some of us don't need to do that. Yeah. And if we don't, why don't we just commit to not? Let's take that off the table. Yeah. And we can focus on other things. One of the things I love about the the story you just told about the lady who who found out that she was going to be home for a good long time, actually in uh, unpacking all of that. Not only did she have certainty for herself, but she knew that she was actually supporting something else that other colleagues needed and the business needed. So there was a way up to the higher need of the business. The business needs to get going. Some people really desperately need to come back. That's okay. I can stay here for now. So it tied everything back to sort of almost a higher, higher purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a interesting comment from, um, from Steve Davis here in the chat, which I think is interesting. So that, you know, the potential for resentment conflict between staff returning from furlough and staff that have been working under increased pressure and how best to bring them together and all move us forward as one. Um, yeah, how do you, how do you facilitate a, a kind of open, honest adult discussion between all staff? You know, yeah, is it better to focus the team? I think several things going on there you know that thing about uh, i've heard so again uh, thinking about so lots of talk about home learning right the difficulty of trying to work with children at home yeah, yeah. And i had a session with a group last week and and someone said well i'm yeah i'm, I'm one of those people that's on their own yeah. you know? and then she burst into tears and, and and it was kind of awful and wonderful it was wonderful because it was so honest and it really made people understand <laughs> And empathize yeah there's been a maybe been a little bit of a taking for granted that those that don't have small people around you know um are going to pick up the slack and not enough appreciation for the consequence of that and i think that um you know that's understandable are we doing enough to acknowledge it yep. um are we are we are, are we making it acceptable to acknowledge it i don't know this question also about how do you facilitate it? You know, how do you have an all, how do you have an all hands? Well, it depends how big your organization is. But in my experience, it's, it's really hard to have a conversation with a large group of people. Um, you know, this is true, whether you're face to face or, or on zoom, you know, kind of, yeah. you know, classic thing when I'm working with, uh, you know, 20 or 30 people, uh, the worst thing you can do is ask for, ask for any comments. when they're <laughs> Staring at you in the gallery view because everyone's like, eh. 
I know I'm not going to be the one, you know, and it's awful. Yeah. And that's pregnant. But it's much better to get people in small groups to talk about stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, and, 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 and just, and Steve, there's a, there's a really great website called um, Liberating Structures that you, you can look up. And on it, they've got a really good description of an exercise called One, Two, Four, All. And I'll just explain it very briefly because it's got such a good underlying principle, right? And the idea is that you start off with any kind of exercise or interaction or kind of inquiry and you get everyone to work on it on their own, write some bits down on a post-it note or a piece of paper or whatever on their own in silence for a minute or so. So that everybody's actually thought about what their response to the thing is. And then you get people to pair up. Okay. But most of us are really comfortable talking to one other person, right? No matter how quiet we are as a person, you know, how unlikely we might be to speak up in a group, we're happy to talk to one person. And then you go from two and maybe to four, uh, and uh, and then from your fours, you might then kind of go to the to the whole group. Now that, that's the kind of the thing in, in a nutshell. And what I like about it is it, it's a way to get every voice heard and into the conversation. Um, now it's not as easy to do that in quite the same way in a remote context, but I think the principle is there. You know, how do you how do you get everybody involved in that conversation, Steve? Well, yeah, you know, ask everybody the question, get them into smaller groups, get some representatives from a smaller group to talk to the whole is a way to keep that stuff still intimate yeah. and still get everything out. I'm, I'm just sort of thinking, going back to Steve's comment about, um, is there resentment conflict between staff returning from furlough and staff that have been working you know, mm. under increased pressure? It's an interesting one as to who would have the resentment there. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I'm like, Oh, this is really hard working, trying to carry on, you know, <clears throat> I could, I could really do with, I'd like to just get the bathroom fixed, you know, yeah. if, if the, she was on the other foot. Yeah. You know, yeah I've yeah. lost my sense of identity. I had no, no purpose to my day. Um, I have no certainty about whether I'll have a job at the end of it. You know, that's extremely yeah. unsettling. So we've, we've talked about the personal level that the leaders have got to look after themselves first, that, that put your own oxygen mask on. Then we've talked about at a personal level, it's important to, um, for everybody to be able to, f to have a safe place to show some vulnerability, maybe some, some best friends or really understanding leaders. Then we've touched on the team level and no, no big surprise there, resilience at a team level is so often about honest communication, authentic communication. Um, and what else did we talk about? It's, uh, we talked about the, the leader giving, um, creating a condition that actually will start the conversation, uh, will actually start prompting their team to look for some solutions on their own. What I want to sort of get into now is at the, the business level, <clears throat> what, what makes a resilient business? Now, there's... I guess we get into the whole topic of, you know, maybe even we end up going into things like anti-fragile, but what, what is it, I had a smile there, what is it makes a resilient organization? Now we're hearing of massive organizations that are just crumbling. Yeah, As you, I was smiling because um, I've got that book, Anti-Fragile. Right. Uh, and I think I've read the first three chapters because it's really hard work. <laughs> yeah, pro I've read them twice, I think, <laughs> those first three chapters. And I love that idea of, um, you know, the opposite of fragile is not, is not resilient. Yeah. Um, you know, so something is fragile, it's brittle, it breaks. Um, uh, but, but the idea of resilience is you kind of, you come back the same, you recover. The opposite of not being broken is that you are stronger as a result of it. Yeah. You know? And I think there's an example in it of, uh, you know, if a child breaks their arm, has one of those, what do they call it? You know, green stick fracture, I think it is. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, actually, that, that, that bone ends up being stronger be, be, because of the way that the, 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 you know, the bone grows around the, the fracture and ends up being stronger. So the, 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 the fragility leads to greater strength. And yeah. I really like that idea right now, that idea that Sophie suggests that you know, despite this being such an awful shock, we might end up coming out of this stronger than we were before, stronger as a group of people you know, coming together in an organization as a, in a shared endeavor. That's really interesting. Yeah. That we might come out of it better. We have an opportunity to try and come out of it better equipped. Um, 
you know, and that requires us perhaps in the first instance to accept where we're at. Yeah. That we, can't, that we cannot do everything, that some stuff's going to have to stop, that there are unavoidable consequences, that there is pain, that we can't actually, we can, we can try and exhaust ourselves keeping that away, but actually it's like, no, it's here. You can't, you can't move on until you've accepted that. Mm. Um, and I think, so I'm not quite answering your question. So what is it, you know, what are the hallmarks of resilient business? You know, probably ones that, that, that are equipped to uh, talk about this stuff, that are equipped, that yeah. able teams to, to, to grapple with problems that, 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 that don't hold them back. The ones that are able to communicate, you know, a clear sense of purpose and direction. Yeah. Um, you know, we could, I suppose, we could get into to business models, and that's, but that's a whole other area of technical. Specialism. Yeah, there is. Yeah. yeah. But, but one of one of the ideas that um, that I really like is a it's a top business author, a guy called Jim Collins. I know we've spoken about him. You know. Um, he he talks about productive paranoia and that's that's actually i think having an organization that's prepared to to go into the paranoia to what could go wrong what can go wrong what's what's coming around the corner but then not being paralyzed by it being energized by it to then say okay we could see that coming what are we what would we do about it mm. and i think starting to look into the future and if, if, you've, if you've managed to create a space where the people in an organization or a team are able to be vulnerable to, 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 to show and air their concerns, then I think the team and the organization can, can use that skill to then say, all right, we're going to go somewhere that's scary. You know, what happens if we did an exercise in the first few weeks of, of lockdown at Breathe where, where we said, all right, so let's assume we've got no new business coming in mm -hmm. and we lose 5% of our customer base every month. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Ah, numbers look scary. Mm -hmm. So what would we do about it? Okay. This is what we would do. How much of that do we need to do now versus how much of that can we say, we'll do that at a certain point if we need to. Yeah. So I think that that sort of idea about being able to, just a glimpse at what what the future might deliver i love that i love that story i love that idea you know and again the idea of you know how do we how do we stretch these muscles and and, and build strength them it's a bit like you know you should you, the fire service don't they? They, they 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 encourage us to plan our escape route right yeah know what you would do if the fire alarm went off plan that now you know you know which child do you grab first and where will you go and which window are you going to climb out of have that plan. I love that idea. I think that's, that's a great one. And, and, and then, as you say, you end up coming up with the things you could just do anyway. That's interesting. Yeah. You, 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 that word, the paranoia, the kind of, it made me think of an example of unproductive paranoia where I was chatting with a team that I've been working with for a while and um, they've got a tricky boss, kind of, kind of brilliant, uh, under a lot of pressure and can be difficult. Yeah. You know, has been known to bull people out in, in an open plan office and do things like that, which, you know, which obviously is not great and has repercussions for everybody who experiences it, not least the person at the sharp end of it. Um, but, but actually brilliant. And when they're not doing that uh, is well liked. And we'd been doing some work trying to encourage that team to be slightly less compliant or cowed. You know, they do a lot of checking because they don't want to get bulled out. Right. And so, yeah, this person had kind of created a, a pattern that was unhelpful because what, what, what she wanted was more autonomy pushed down. The people were reluctant to take that risk. And this person was away traveling and came back, came back right the week before lockdown. Yeah. To discover that the team had uh, got a sense of the temperature. They had uh, off their own bat, the leadership team had organized uh, IT to be ordered. They had uh, started sending people home to practice working from home. And they were kind of way ahead. In fact, they were way ahead of the whole organization, which yeah. made the boss feel about comfortable. And so, uh, you know, we had, we had words about this afterwards. Our initial reaction was like, what are you doing? When they should have been, wow, that's amazing. You know, well done. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it was really well done because they were ahead of the curve. And what it meant was that when they did go a few days later, everybody had what they needed. And it was a great example of them doing exactly. The great thing about that was that they were one step ahead and they felt they had the agency to just crack on and sort that out, even though the boss wasn't there. The fact that the boss came back and was incredibly paranoid about it, (laughs) not that happy. No. Disaster. Um, another another comment, really, this is an interesting one. What do you mean by coming out of it? And uh, how can we have confidence in a in a resilient economic, social, and environmental system? Y- yeah. You know, and I'm honestly, I'm not sure. I, I'm not completely sure we can. No, you know, maybe that's one of the learnings. Yeah. Well, a friend of mine furloughed his whole team and shut the business down. Put it in. And, you know, and, and, and then he said to me, see if I can last four months. I can't last six. I think it was just an announcement that it might be six months. I don't think, you know, and he said, the thing is, I'm not sure I even want to build a business again if this one goes under. You know, why, 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 put, why have all that heartache? Yeah. It, this can happen so easily. And I thought that's really interesting. And so that does then raise, raise questions about, well, what kind of organizations do we want? Yeah. And, and, <clears throat> And do they look very different, you know? And that might be, I was chatting to a friend of mine who's a builder. What's life like for builders right now? Well, you know, they're allowed to go out of work, but they can't get materials. And the materials they can get are incredibly expensive because prices have shot yeah. up. So you can't make any margin. So it's working, but you're not going to get paid. You know, and what's, what's going to come next? Well, everyone's going to be really careful. They're going to build things. Well, you know, don't know. But the architects are busy. Lots of people are sitting in their living rooms going, we need an extension. So, yeah. you know, if you can weather the storm, things will come out of the other side. And there's just something really interesting. You know, why architects? Like, we've got three offices. We don't need three offices. Yeah. We just need one for a postal address. You know, we can save all that money, actually. You know, there's that, that sense of actually that traditional kind of business is going to look very different. Not yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need it. So I, I think... You know, going out of this, ah, who'd, who'd have said, you know, six months ago, somebody had come to me and said, we're going to do, we're going to do a big social experiment. We're going to make everybody work from home. And, and you say, what do you mean? The, the whole company? And they went, no, the whole world. We can't, we can't second guess what can be around the corner, but I think we can take some learnings from this as we go. Not, not necessarily when we're out of this, this one and, no, things are together again, but I think we can take some learnings to say what what do we need to change in our organisations um, to 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 give us that extra level of strength, maybe the um, the the tools to handle that extra level of paranoia. Mm. I'm aware we're getting close to the end of time, um, and I've there's a there's a question in from from Emily or a comment in about envisaging the welcome back to the team, um, especially when an organization has been furloughed. What do we suggest about um, potentially damaging actions from the employer that, that have been intended or, or hoped to have had a positive impact? Yeah, yes, yes, the good intentions that go wrong. Okay, so I, I, yeah, uh, I, I don't know, that's a, that's a really tricky one to answer. It's so context specific, isn't it? And I suppose the things that you can do is, um, you know, you've got to talk to the people that aren't there, right? Mm. What has life been like? Um, and, and, and what have they missed? You know, someone said to me, oh, I really don't want to be furloughed. I've just come back from maternity leave, you know, and that was hard enough, you know, to discover in, and yeah. she'd had a, she had a year off and she's like, you know, everything had changed. <laughs> it was all the same, but everything had changed. You know, there was a whole kind of narrative that, 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 was, that was beyond her because she'd missed all that action and all the rest of it. So there's that, that kind of, it's a bit like coming back from maternity leave, but, but, but way more sensitive, you know, because yeah. you didn't have any sense of other identity. So there's that. So, there's, so I think talking to people before they come back, you know, and making a really big effort, you know, so maybe it's actually, it's the senior people that need to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, like an update. That might be something you could do that was good. Maybe this one loops sort of us back nicely to almost where we started by the, the the topic of vulnerability is actually the 
the leaders in the organization being vulnerable enough to say, look, I had to make some decisions. I've, I've no doubt messed up on some, got some right, you know, and, um, and, and we kind of are where we are. So it's not actually the, the, the confident bullish leader that, that tries to rah, rah the troops again as they come back. It's sort of an acceptance that what's been going on has been imperfect. Yeah. And that they may not know all of the answers. And even this welcome back is, is hard to understand how it's going to work. And yeah, you know, but maybe there's something really important about acknowledging it's acknowledging all of that and also acknowledging that we now need you. Now you're back. Yeah. So just to sort of start wrapping things up, we're almost at, at the hour. Um, I think if I'd sort of summarize some of it is that, that resilience doesn't just happen, be it at the personal level, you've got to take responsibility for your own resilience. At the team level, then maybe the leader takes responsibility for sharing the overall responsibility for making a resilient team. Mm. And then that should build into, into the business level of responsibility or mm. resilience. Um, and then at the, also at the company level, maybe as a result of all of this that's going on, we need to learn some lessons and move forward. So there's no going back. There's no welcome back. It's, it's sort of almost a welcome forward. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the idea, I love the idea that resilience is, is not a gift. It's actually worked for. It's a muscle that you have to train. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So... Um, Final word, any, any sort of final words of advice? There's, there's putting you on the spot. Listen, listen to people, you know, I think, um, one of the most generous things that we can do is to properly listen to someone with a, with a quiet mind, without any of our own nonsense in the way and our concerns, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Properly listening to people. Uh, it's a generous thing to do. And when we're feeling, confused, scared, isolated, you know, lost, uh, even if you can't take any of that away from me, just allowing me to tell you that. And maybe that's, you know, listen to your teams when they're away from you, when they're closer to you. Maybe that's, that's my last word. And that, I just add to that, that's the skill that we've all learned or are learning on web meetings. Because if you don't listen to the other person, A, they see you're not listening, and B, you then interrupt them. So let's, let's take that skill and carry it forward. Look, Steve's been, been fascinating, always good to, to talk. We have two more webinars lined up over the coming weeks with you. Um, the next one is all about the transition as we start to, um, as we start to get some guidance from the government about about what it's going to be like moving back into into normal world uh, we've got one around around the transitioning um, and then and then we're envisaging one at some point in the future about the the coming back uh, we might we might sort of have, have we might sort of all start to come back in a hurry but that that's what we're thinking about um, hope everybody that's listening has has um, got something from it um, been really interesting for us to talk love to take any questions from you we are recording the webinar uh, we don't actually have any slides from it but I'm sure the brilliant content guys at breathe will start to um, pick a piece pick apart some of the ideas we've been talking about and we'll definitely share the recording mm. so Steve once again thank you it's been brilliant and thanks to everybody for joining thanks for having us cheers guys thank you.